Our gospel reading for today comes from the third book of our New Testament, Luke, uh, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35, and that's found on page 68. All the Bibles are right there. They got moved. They're on the floor. Hear our gospel. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. When there's a phrase like this where he was kept, we really think God is doing it. That God is keeping them from realizing that it's Jesus. But I think more so we see what we expect to see. The angel at the tomb says, why do you look for the living among the dead? Here it's the opposite. We don't look for the dead among the living. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? Whenever something tragic happens, we always assume that everyone knows about it. That everyone knows about our loved one that passed away. Are you, the only one that didn't know? Are you the only one that didn't know that I'm having a bad day? And then we get mad at people when they're insensitive, when we had a bad day, and for some reason they claim they didn't know about it. But everybody knows. That's why I cut you off while I was driving. Stop honking at me. I'm having a bad day. He asked them, what are you discussing? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us, that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. <clears throat> Language in this section is fairly interesting. You can tell they don't really believe it. They don't really believe the source of their information, these women from the tomb. Earlier, just the earlier section, the disciples dismissed what the women say as idle talk, as little more than gossip. It's amazing how we dismiss our untrusted sources. When I was in college, going all the way through to seminary, occasionally I'd have someone come and teach a class that had less education. And because, you know, in that academic world, that bothered me at that time. But then I realized, you learn from teenagers, you learn from toddlers, you learn from babies, you learn from rocks, you learn from trees. You can learn from pretty much everyone. It doesn't really matter who it is. You can learn from everyone. These disciples, these travelers, learned that the hard way. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Bible scholars say that Jesus is referenced one way or another some 300 times in the Old Testament. So he must have been talking to them for a really long time on the road. And still, after this 300 verse diatribe, they want him to stay longer. I wonder how many verses you would put up with me walking you through. I bet it's less than 300. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem 
and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told them what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is our gospel reading for the day. But well, you're probably going to want to keep your Bible open, if that's your thing. Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. That story that we hear today only appears in the Gospel of Luke. It's only here that we learn about these travelers. We know next to nothing about them other than one of them is named Cleopas, and they're on this road. And they're talking about these Easter events that we just got done celebrating. But they're not just discussing these events. Think about it more like putting a Red Sox fan in the room with a Yankees fan. Do they discuss which team is better? No. no. Think about it more so like this. Put a Seahawks fan in the room with a 49ers fan. <laughs> Do they just quietly discuss the pertinent details about who is better? No. <coughs> the Greek word that is used here for discussing is more on the level of examining. But I would go one step further and say ripping apart. What do you think of Colin Kaepernick and Jim Harbaugh? That's what I thought. <laughs> they are in the midst of a true Easter argument. The Gospel of Luke likes getting to the nitty gritty. You could say that the whole Gospel is built around this example. Turn with me, if you will, to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, which is found on page 43. The book begins in verse 1, as most books in the Bible do. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. It is in the investigation, it is in where the rubber meets the road, of seeing what you can and cannot accept, that you truly begin to have faith. The letter here is written, Luke is written, specifically to this person, Theophilus. But their name is a little too good to be true. It's a Greek word that means lover of God. If you want to be a lover of God, you Theophilus. You need to investigate. Go a little bit further down in that same account, verse one, or chapter 1, verse 26. The angel of the Lord, named Gabriel, comes and appears to Mary, who is a teenager, and tells her that she is with child, that she is pregnant. And this angel that's glowing, probably appeared right in front of her, just like Jesus vanished, here the angel appears. She knows that something's going on. But does she accept it outright? No. It starts out. But Mary was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. She went even further to argue back against this pregnancy announcement, saying in verse 34, How can this be since I am a virgin? We would expect her to accept what this angel has to say. If an angel appeared to me right now, standing right here, and said, Adrian, you're pregnant. <laughs> I would accept that. I wouldn't know how that worked. I would have great fear for nine months from now. But if an angel appeared right in front of me and said that, I would have to say, oh, okay, I, I guess I am pregnant. But Mary pushes back. Because Luke likes it that way. Luke believes that's what it's about. That's what faith is about. You get more out of these godly moments not by blindly accepting them, but by pushing back, having this argument, even with an angel, about what you can believe and what you cannot. We would say Mary is being disrespectful. Luke would say that she is investigating. And a little later in Luke, in chapter 2, verse 46, which is on page 45, we find out that Jesus was not the good little church boy that you would expect him to be. 
You thought pastor's kids were bad, run around doing whatever they want. <laughs> now take a look at God's only son. He's not sitting respectfully in the temple with his hands folded, listening quietly as the adults have their all-important conversation. His parents have found that Jesus was missing, and after three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. You can only imagine the kinds of questions that Jesus as a boy would be asking in the temple. You should hear some of the questions that were asked to me in the middle of confirmation class. We talked about centaurs. A lot. We talked about the TV show Ghost Adventures. We talked about near-death experiences. Was that always on topic? No. But those discussions are good to have. Because it's in the questioning that we get our answers. Denying confusion does not lead to finding truth. And Luke is clear, there is value in the questioning. Whether it comes from the most learned individual or the youngest child present, there is wisdom in the question. Which brings us back to our Emmaus section on page 68. To these travelers on the road who find themselves trying to get to the bottom of these stories that they have heard, to the things they have been told. And it, it gets to the important part when Jesus asked them exactly what they had heard. And that leads in verse 21 with a really great word. Verse 21 begins, But we had hoped that Jesus was one, the one to redeem Israel. The word translated there for we had hope is helpismen, which is a past tense verb. I know everybody loves when I talk about Greek. It's a past tense verb that's about continued action. We had hoped and hoped and hoped and hoped. But then that hope died. It's the past tense now. Because our hope died with one man. And Jesus appears immediately critical of them in verse 25, calling them foolish, saying, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? At first we think, man, Jesus is mean. Jesus is not a nice guy here. This is not buddy Jesus. This is flip your table over Jesus. Isn't Luke all about investigation? Isn't Luke all about asking the questions? Here they ask the questions and they get chewed out by Jesus. There's a specific reason for that. Had these travelers actually looked into things for themselves? Had they questioned? Had they investigated? Or had they sat quietly in their little echo chamber, literally a locked room, where even Jesus had to break in to get in. The travelers, a little earlier, told a story rather dismissively about the woman at the tomb. It's in verse 22. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said. But they didn't see Jesus there. But Jesus would ask them, did you look into it? Did you go and find out for yourself what is going on? Did you find out what Jesus did? What Jesus said? What it was predicted that Jesus would do? No. They had done what many of us do when we hear someone we don't trust. We nod along until they leave. Thank you, that's very interesting. Have a good day. Now, in case you didn't know, there are two main topics of discussion that you're not allowed to talk about in civilized conversation. God and politics. And yes, we could probably add to that sports. And for the most part, society has followed this. We only talk about these hot-button issues to the people that agree with us, to the people in our echo chamber. To the people that we know will say, hey, you're right. You know how I know you're right? Because I'm right. And you say the same thing I say. <laughs> That's who we talk to. That's who we share with. We don't do that with other people. We keep it separated. We keep it civilized. We are on our own. But what do we miss out on? What have the travelers missed out on? 
The time for the end of silence has come. There have been few times in our country when we have been more divided than we are right now. Few times in religion that we've seen more splintering than we see right now. This politically correct, only say the right thing at the right time stuff isn't working. It's just work to further divide us rather than protect us. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about Paul. Let's talk about Barack Obama. Don't shout at me. <laughs> but we, as a church community, need to share our stories more. Discuss more. Not just with the people that agree with us, but especially with the ones that don't. Now, for a long time, I have wondered why we don't experience more miracles. Why we don't see more miracles. In our biblical accounts, we have story after story, moment after moment, where God shows up and does these big, miraculous, life-changing things. And I've always wondered, why don't they happen more often? Why don't we see more today? Now, I read a lot of books about miracles and God moments. Go figure. And I no longer think that we are lacking in miracles. I think we've just stopped talking about them. I was recently reading a book called To Heaven and Back by Mary Neal. In this book, she tells, you're never going to believe it, a story about going to heaven and back, which you can view with skepticism if you want. But she also talks about all these miracles that surrounded that moment, not just one miraculous God moment, but a lifetime of God moment. And she says that everywhere she goes, everywhere she talks about her story, talks about her book, passes on this information, she says people say the exact same thing to her in private. And they say, that miracle you had, that exact same thing happened to me. I just haven't told anyone because I didn't think anyone would believe me. What have we missed out on when we do not share, when we do not investigate? Jesus refused to let the travelers off so easy. He wants them to enter into the investigation, to enter into this dialogue, a dialogue that happens between two people, two people that might not agree. To enter into a dialogue even with a book, a scripture, the Bible. The gospel tells us that he opened scripture to them. He takes them back deeper into the holy writings from the time of the prophets. Talking to them undoubtedly about Isaiah 53, where the one laid down his body for all. Or Psalm 22 that says the words of Jesus, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The predictions about this suffering servant and who he would be. The Bible's not about this is it. The Bible's about a conversation. About looking at those words and saying, what do they mean to me? Jesus and Luke are basically shouting here in one harmonious note, do not believe in the God of expectations, but believe in the God that is real. The God that you can meet. The God that you have met. The Emmaus story ends with a grand revealing. With them getting to see this risen Lord. But how did they get there? Through never wavering faith? <clears throat> through never once questioning? Or doubting? Or just accepting whatever random fact was put in front of their face? No, they ate with God. They argued with God. They discussed with their neighbor until they knew that the God they had met was the God that is. Not the God that was. Or the God for other people. Luke had Theophilus. Mary had the angel. Jesus had the elders in the temple and the travelers had each other. God, Jesus, and Luke want you to ask the questions. To follow the questions. To let the questions and doubts and uncertainties lead you to that door that is waiting to be knocked on and open. You're going to hear stories of faith today from our confidence. Stories of questions. Stories of investigation. Stories of uncertainty. But most certainly, stories of faith. Will it be the same as your stories? I sure hope not. God has a special relationship plan for each and every one of you. And that is why it's so exciting, so important, 
to hear how other people have or have not experienced this God of never failing hope. The phrase that these travelers uttered along the road, we had hoped, only becomes troublesome when it becomes a thing of the past. <laughs> only becomes troublesome when it becomes a lie. Only becomes troublesome when it causes you to put the book or person or world away that is screaming out to you, look at this God of hope that so very much wants to get to know you. To avoid all topics of contention, division, or uncertainty. To only talk with the hand-picked travelers that you know agree with you means that you're going to miss out on the risen Lord that's walking beside you on the road, that walks beside you every day. We had hope, and we still have good reason for that. Amen. <clears throat>